Arthropods could be argued to be the most successful group of animals on the planet. Certainly in terms of number of species, that is true. Those who study nematode worms might argue that we just haven't identified all of you know, the nematodes to an appreciable, uh, a comparable extent, so that maybe nematodes and arthropods have about the same, you know, diversity. But that being said, of species identified uh, to date, there are certainly more arthropods than any other group of organisms on the planet. So in terms of that, they are um, certainly the most uh, successful. Uh, now, many arthropods are quite small. So if you were to look in pond water, uh, in addition to insects, which are very prevalent, one would realize that there are all of these uh, arthropods which are microscopic or uh, nearly so. And so especially when I talk about their uh, evolution, uh, the idea that arthropods don't have to be big, uh, you know, that many of them, you know, could have been uh, smaller. Uh, that's uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, a, a relevant uh, topic. Um, before going uh, to fossil uh, arthropods, you know, just while I'm in these videos. So here in an aquatic environment is a water mite, uh, which is uh, an arthropod, uh, but obviously you can see, you know, how small it is. There are some which are uh, like this one, just visible to uh, the naked eye. Um, others uh, like uh, the previous ones, uh, which are uh, microscopic. Um, and then there are others. So uh, crayfish, crabs, uh, which we'll see uh, later. Certainly there were giant sea scorpions in uh, the past. Uh, even today there are these giant water bugs, uh, not as large as some of the insects uh, reached in the Carboniferous period when oxygen levels were much uh, greater, and that you could say uh, find uh, relatives of dragonflies uh, with a three foot wingspan, uh, for example, or enormous uh, spiders. Um, uh, but uh, still, there are, uh, you know, very large uh, insects um, uh, today, including, uh, you know, these giant water bugs. There were once uh, millipede uh, relatives, uh, which could get to be uh, longer than 10 feet in. Um, uh, in length. So here you can see a giant water bug. So arthropods, uh, they are uh, very uh, common, the most diverse animals in terms of species. They are certainly diverse from large forms to forms that you need a microscope uh, uh, to see. Um, they uh, are an ancient group of uh, animals as, uh, as we will see. Um, but they're also very complex. So if you look at them, you know, they have uh, an exoskeleton, they have uh, segmented limbs, uh, obviously um, more complex than the worms, uh, which were covered uh, to uh, this uh, point. Um, and so one could then ask, where do the, uh, where does this complexity come from? How did uh, arthropods evolve? So then going back to the fossil record, um, when do arthropods exist? Well, most of the Earth's history is known as the Precambrian period, from the formation of the Earth, uh, say 4.6 billion years ago, up until uh, about half a billion years ago, say 542 million years ago. This is the Precambrian period. And during the Precambrian period, which is the overwhelming majority of the history of life on Earth, there are zero arthropods. Just as there are zero true mollusks known from this time period, there are zero echinoderms. So the higher groups of animals alive today, they simply are not present in the Precambrian. But that being said, at the very end of the um, uh, Precambrian in what is known as the Ediacaran uh, period. There were then animals which seemed to be transitional in between the simplest of animals and then the um, uh, these higher uh, groups. Uh, and so there, uh, this Kimberella here, um, it's not a mollusk, but it seems to have some molluscan features. This animal is not an echinoderm, uh, 
nor is this an echinoderm, but they seem to have some echinoderm features. And then finally, these last organisms, they are not arthropods. There are lists of traits that one must have to be an arthropod. You know, a hard exoskeleton, segmented limbs, that's literally what the word arthropod means, jointed uh, limbs, uh, the fusion of specific uh, head uh, segments, uh, etc. Um, but these animals have some of those features, but not all. So once again, in the Precambrian, at the very end, before the Cambrian and the explosion of biodiversity, which occurs in the Cambrian, there are these animals, which aren't worms. They seem to be more complex than worms, but they aren't arthropods either. When the Cambrian begins, as we'll, we'll uh, we'll see in just a second in videos, there are animals like this, anomalocaris. Notice the segments, the big compound eyes, certainly more complex than any, um, uh, any uh, worm. Um, we see animals which are called lobopods, lots of them, which have limbs, not necessarily jointed limbs. Once again, the word arthropod literally means jointed uh, limbs, um, but there are um, animals uh, which then have legs, all right, but not jointed legs. They have some of the features of arthropods. Um, then there are animals which seem to be arthropods, um, but if so, then they are the most primitive arthropods known, known uh, more primitive than all arthropods which would come later. So the question is, where you know, do arthropods come from? And the answer is clearly not that they have always uh, existed, um, because simply they can't um, be found from uh, most of Earth's uh, history. So most of Earth's history passes without any arthropods. Even when arthropods appear, they are not modern arthropods. So they are not crayfish and crabs and insects and spiders um, in uh, the Paleozoic. Uh, and so arthropods have not always existed. Modern arthropods have not always existed. Um, but then another legitimate question is, if you were to look at this praying mantis, this insect, look how complex it is. It has that hard exoskeleton. It has these jointed legs. And once you have these jointed legs, then they can be specialized. All right, and so some can be specialized for, uh, for uh, grabbing or uh, prey manipulation, uh, for swimming, uh, et cetera. Um, the arthropod head is actually, you know, quite complex and results from the fusion of lots of separate segments. So there are lots of things which were once uh, separate that now then uh, fuse to form this arthropod um, uh, head. And so uh, arthropods are quite uh, complex. Where did this complexity come from? Is it possible for complexity to evolve in stages. Well, if we were to go to the end of the Ediacaran period and then the early Paleozoic, one finds animals which have some arthropod features, but not enough uh, to call them arthropods. So the anomalocards, which included um, forms which were three feet and longer, and thus, you know, for the Cambrian, super predators, you know, among the largest animals um, uh, known. Um, these were certainly animals which they were complicated. They had segments. They had big compound eyes. Uh, they had, uh, you know, um, head elements uh, with lots of diverse uh, features. Um, but they didn't have the head of an arthropod, nor did they have segmented limbs. Some of them were just odd. This one seems to have had five eyes and this extendable uh, proboscis, uh, for uh, example. And so there were. Um, you know, animals which had some arthropod features, but not enough to call them arthropods. Um, there were other animals which actually did have legs, these things known as lobopods, um, but they were not jointed legs. Some did not have an exoskeleton. Um, and so one, uh, they certainly did not have the fusion of the head elements, uh, which we see in um, uh, in uh, modern arthropods. So once again, uh, before any modern arthropods are known, there are animals which have some, but not all of uh, the features of arthropods. There was hallucinogenia, uh, which is interesting because uh, 
when it was found because it had spines and legs. The question was, well, which is which, you know, and, and for, uh, I understand that originally uh, the depiction of, of the fossil was actually upside down because uh, these uh, were uh, confused. Um, there is actually, a, you know, this uh, uh, organism known that did have jointed legs and it did have an exoskeleton from the early Cambrian, but it had this weird, you know, head which, you know, perhaps um, had a suction apparatus where it could suck uh, debris and tiny organisms off uh, the floor of the ocean, certainly not an arthropod head. And so arthropods have not always existed. And before there are any uh, arthropods, there are um, animals which have some, but not all of the arthropod features. And so it seems that the arthropod body plan developed in, in stages so that you could, you know, have some arthropod uh, complexity, uh, but not all. And even today, there are organisms known as velvet worms. And then there are tardigrades. Tardigrades and velvet worms, if one were to say compare either anatomical structures or their genes, seem they have some arthropod features, but not all. And so in the great family tree of life, arthropods are not, you know, this group isolated from all others. They fit into the family tree and they are more closely related to some other uh, groups than others. So tardigrades. Um, uh, and so here, uh, you know, of the family tree of life, arthropods fit in to this uh, uh, to this uh, tree, uh, being more closely related to some than others. And then even today, like I said, these tardigrades, they have segments, they have limbs. Now they are clearly not arthropod limbs. These tardigrades are much simpler than uh, arthropods. Um, but nevertheless, here we can see, you know, a modern representative of what a sister group might look like. Now remember, animals are often smaller than, than we think. And, and so if you were to ask questions about how a group evolves, if you know, our idea of animals are, you know, lions and giraffes and elephants and dogs and people. Well, we're thinking of the big complex ones. And then obviously then, you know, discussing animal evolution becomes uh, seemingly improbable, you know. Um, but when one thinks of the diversity of animals, lots are microscopic. There are very simple animals which are uh, microscopic, like, you know, placozoans. Um, and there are cnidarians, which are almost microscopic. Uh, there are worms, nematodes, which are uh, microscopic, and there are arthropods, which are microscopic and parts of the zooplankton. And so here we see an arthropod relative, um, which can feed on all of the living, you know, protists swimming around um, and use those as uh, food. So uh, these early animals didn't have to be big or overly complex so that, you know, some of the segmentation or limbs could have been worked out in, in microscopic animals where they would not have had, you know, as many uh, components to their uh, structures. So uh, arthropods seem to have evolved in stages because there are animals today which, whether it be anatomically or genetically, have some but not all of the features of arthropods. And there uh, are uh, fossil animals which had some but not all of the features of uh, arthropods. Um, when the Cambrian uh, begins, uh, arthropods are uh, present, including uh, this group here known as the trilobites. Uh, now, I'm just going to, you know, very quickly, you know, say a few things about trilobites. Um, but trilobites were one of animals' first great success stories. So when the Cambrian begins and, and then goes into the Ordovician period, there are trilobites everywhere. So when we talk about genera, not, not species, a larger group called genera, there are thousands of genera of arthropods known. And so um, part of this Cambrian explosion um, whether it because now oxygen levels are higher in the air, whether it because now um, there was a, a greater stratification of the uh, environments of the ocean with reefs and reef organisms beginning to form, whether there was uh, predation, whether 
just having certain features like an exoskeleton, jointed limbs, compound eyes, and a body cavity then allow for greater diversification. Um, animals uh, evolve new groups at a rate which had not been seen earlier, and trilobites are one of the you know, first great uh, testaments to that. There are so many different kinds of uh, uh, of uh, trilobites. So uh, this obviously could be, you know, if we have thousands and thousands of kinds of them, um, this could obviously be a long conversation. I'd just like to kind of introduce this. Now, in addition to trilobites, there are almost trilobites. So if one were to classify arthropods, these examples here would be part of what's called trilobite amorpha, not true trilobites, but the sister group of trilobites. So once again, um, complexity can evolve in stages, and you can have animals with some, but not all of the features of uh, trilobites. And so, you know, there's this enormous um, a diversity of uh, trilobites. So trilobites, again, they're classified into groups. So there are, in addition to species, there are genera, and then there are families of related uh, uh, trilobites. And then these families can then be clustered together into superfamilies, infraorders, etc. Now, some share unusual features, such as the fusion of eyes, uh, et cetera. But you, know, you just get the idea, there are so many types of arthropods. Very often in fossils, what is preserved are the head shields, all right, and someone could look at uh, these. Uh, this uh, group was interesting because they gradually lost uh, their eyes. Um, many of the fossils which are known are actually um, molts uh, so that, um, uh, and so uh, many uh, animals, if you're going to have an exoskeleton, have to shed their, uh, their skins in order to grow. Uh, so my skeleton is on the inside, but if my skeleton was on the outside, the only way that I could grow would be to shed the exoskeleton of my smaller self, my juvenile self, and then I could, you know, expand it and then develop a new exoskeleton, you know, for our larger body size. And so because these animals underwent molts, a lot of the fossils are not of dead animals, but rather of molts that they underwent. Uh, and so something about the trilobite body form, which is perhaps you know, similar to what we see in their closest living relatives today, the horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are not trilobites, but if you were asking what arthropods are their closest rel relatives, horseshoe crabs would be it. They have these jointed limbs, which could then be specialized some for you know, prey capture, some for uh, swimming. Uh, so uh, there were certainly lots of things that uh, you know, made uh, trilobites you know, adaptive. And in the early Paleozoic, they are simply uh, everywhere. Uh, once again, here I just have a close-up of horseshoe crabs, uh, which are alive today. But if you were asking, you know, you know, I've seen the top of a trilobite, you know, in its exoskeleton with its segments, but what would the rest of it have looked like? Well, the legs of the horseshoe crab, you know, were perhaps give you the, uh, the best um, example of uh, uh, this. And obviously these can then, you know, be specialized for diverse, uh, func uh, diverse functions. So, uh, the early Paleozoic, you know, the trilobites greatly diversify. Even this group, uh, uh, the horseshoe crab uh, relatives, greatly diversify. But there are some mass extinctions. Uh, horseshoe crabs are still alive today, but their diversity is uh, much less than what once was. Um, but trilobites, as I'll mention, uh, are uh, completely uh, extinct. So, um, as we go through uh, you know, the, the Paleozoic, uh, there are uh, trilobites um, and thousands and thousands of them, but it's important to remember that the Paleozoic lasts hundreds of millions of years. So it starts at the Cambrian, 540 million years ago uh, or so, and it ends with the end Permian extinctions, 250 uh, million uh, years. So, you know, that's almost 300 million years uh, where trilobites are known. 300 million years is a very long time, and planet Earth is a very big place. But not all trilobites lived in the same place 
nor at the same time. So for example, the Cambrian fossils of the Burgess Shale in Canada, um, they have some uh, trilobite fossils, but not all, right? Just like today, there are animals which live in specific uh, parts of, um, uh, of uh, the world. Um, and so the same thing would apply to uh, trilobites. So there were some trilobites which are only known from the Cambrian period. They are among the first trilobites. There are some that are no only known from the Ordovician period. Some are known from the Cambrian and Ordovician periods, but no longer, uh, not after that. The Ordovician uh, was a time of a mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician. And so many groups do not survive the Ordovician into the Silurian period. There are trilobites which are only known uh, from the uh, Silurian period, some which are only known from the uh, Devonian uh, period, as, uh, et cetera. There was a mass extinction at the end of the Devonian period. Um, so, the mass extinction at the end of the Ordovician and the other ones at the end of the mass at the end of the Devonian, that greatly reduced trilobite diversity. So trilobites were most diverse at the beginning of the Paleozoic, but then they get hit hard at, the, at this mass extinction, even harder at the end of this one. So there aren't that many um, trilobites which survive into the end of the Paleozoic, the Carboniferous, and the, um, uh, and the Permian periods. Uh, although there are some trilobites which last uh, the end of the, uh, uh, the Permian and thus can contribute to biostratigraphy. So if one uh, studies these trilobites and learns, you know, this one is known from the Cambrian, every time we date, you know, these rocks, it's a Cambrian animal. You know, this ones we're dating from the, uh, the Ordovician, this one we're dating from the Silurian, etc. that can then be useful because after you've said, you know, we have established that the only time that these, you know, are known, you know, is from this time period. If you then find a layer of rocks that you can't date, say with, you know, absolute dating techniques, but you find, you know, a specific trilobite, you can say up until this time, the only ones of this, um, uh, of this group that have ever been found are from this time period. So I'm going to now use these trilobite fossils to say, I think these are Silurian rocks. I think these you know, are Devonian uh, rocks, uh, et cetera. And so the Paleozoic was the time of the trilobites, although they were at the most diverse at, um, at the early at Paleozoic. By the end, there are only a few groups which survive and it is the extinction at the end of the Paleozoic, which end the um, uh, which end this great group of uh, trilobites. So that's an important point that even though these animals lived uh, at um, uh, you know in the fossil record or lived in the Paleozoic, 300 million years just about is a really long time, and a planet is a really big place. So this does not mean that all of these lived together. Now, um, another group evolved known as the sea scorpions or Eurypterids. Uh, so while today we think of scorpions as animals which live on land, the earliest members were marine. So the land living scorpions evolved from um, marine uh, uh, sea uh, scorpions, um, which were quite diverse and could reach a considerable uh, sizes. So, you know, they're certainly famous. They include the state fossil of uh, New York. So, you know, here is a sea scorpion. You know, you can see it's, you know, very uh, considerable um, uh, size. Um, and, you know, uh, they certainly vary. And they would have been among the early animals to come out on the land. There are fossils of sea scorpions with primitive plants. So just like, and I'll show a video presently, crabs can come onto land briefly, crayfish can come onto land. So even aquatic arthropods, they can come onto land for a while. These sea scorpions seem to have done just that. And from the marine and aquatic sea scorpions, then the terrestrial uh, sea scorpions would, um, uh, would uh, then evolve. 
And so, and forgive me, just one thing I'd said earlier was uh, the horseshoe crab is alive today. It is the closest living relative of trilobites. And as you can see here, uh, the Xiphosaurans, which you know is the group to which the horseshoe crabs uh, develop, they were once far more diverse than uh, they are uh, today. Now, arthropods are just so diverse that one of the first things that we do is, you know, we split them into then groups. And um, at the big grouping that uh, uh, we create first, uh, this is based on genetic evidence, but also anatomical features. And we refer to their mouth parts, which in general vary between the one group called the chelicerata, um, which include the scorpions, the ticks, the spiders, but then the trilobites and the horseshoe crabs. And then the mandibulata, which includes crustaceans like crabs and crayfish, uh, but then also insects, uh, centipedes, and uh, millipedes. And so the uh, early arthropods had lots of um, mouth parts. But if you were to look at the mouth parts of this scorpion, all right, so here are these mouth parts. Look here closely. Um, these are what are called chelicerae. Uh, in this case, they're more, you know, grasping, um, but these are then uh, different. Uh, so here's uh, what we see here. Here's a spider's mouth parts. These are different. Um, here's a tick's mouth parts. Uh, these are different from what we see in uh, the insects and crustaceans. So here's a crab larva. Um, the uh, mandibulata includes crustaceans, insects, centipedes, millipedes. And look at here this termite, the very different mouth parts um, there. Now, mouth parts certainly vary. Insects have modified their mouth parts, for example. Um, but when we take the huge group of arthropods, one of the first things that we do is split them into these two groups, the chelicerata and the um, mandibulata. The chelicerata with the trilobites were very successful with the sea scorpions. So obviously the, the chelicerata, ah, enormously successful in the Paleozoic. But then as I had said, the Eurypterid sea scorpions and the um, trilobites become extinct. Now the chelicerates do make it out onto land, all right? And so while the ancestral chelicerates are aquatic, um, scorpions will come out onto land. And also these animals here, as I'll pick up with um, in a later uh, video, also come out onto land and are the ancestors of spiders, uh, ticks, and uh, mites. And so chelicerates make it out onto land in two big groups, you know, the, the spider tick uh, clade and then also the scorpion uh, uh, clade. So they make it out onto land. And so to do the other group, uh, the mandibulata. All right, now just one last video on the uh, Eurypterids. Um, here, once again, because 300 million years is a long time and a planet is a big place, not all animals, you know, in the fossil record lived at the same time. So these Eurypterid sea scorpions, they were, they were quite uh, diverse, uh, first known as the, from the Ordovician, um, but the last of them die in the mass extinction at the end of the Permian in which 90% of life dies out. So the sea scorpion Eurypterids, they are you know, Paleozoic uh, animals. If you look then at the other half of the arthropod uh, family uh, tree, um, then uh, we have uh, crustaceans, centipedes, millipedes, and insects. Now, I just, I'll mention those at the end of, of this video, but uh, the arthropods on land, uh, I wanted to, you know, put off until, uh, you know, we're talking about amphibians on land. One quick point, however, um, when we think of arthropods, you know, a lot of times we think of thick, uh, large ones, but as I pointed out earlier, many of them are microscopic or nearly so. So when we ask, you know, what do baby fish eat? A lot of them are eating zooplankton. Um, so there are lots of animals which are microscopic or nearly so, so small that they can then feed on microscopic organisms like blue-green algae or, you know, paramecia and the like. So uh, crustaceans are a diverse group, not only including lobsters and crabs, which are very big, but then lots of elements of the zooplankton. And these are known um, 
you know, from uh, dating back to the Cambrian, the first uh, crustaceans. Now, just as um, the chelicerates can make it out onto land, um, so too can the mandibulata. Uh, so for example, these crabs, uh, there are crabs which are almost entirely aquatic, um, but can come onto land rarely. There are crabs which come onto land frequently, so they're frequently both in water and on land. And then there are crabs which are primarily terrestrial, um, going in water only rarely. And so uh, animals do not have to be aquatic or terrestrial. They can be intermediate. And the same structures which allow them to breathe in water, if kept moist, can perform gas exchange in air as well. So crabs are, you know, a, um, an example of, uh, of uh, that. Uh, and uh, so going back to the Cambrian, in addition to the arthropods in the chelicerate uh, uh, group, uh, you also have uh, arthropods in the mandibulata as well, including crustaceans and many small ones. So, you know, perhaps not as, um, you know, successful or, or impressive as the trilobites. But nevertheless, once again, when one thinks of food chains, you know, there's all of these microscopic organisms and it's very small uh, animals, such as these crustaceans known from the Cambrian, uh, which can then uh, eat those and then be food for larger uh, animals. And so one does not get the larger animals without, you know, the smaller animals in uh, the food chain. So the evolution of small arthropods um, is uh, certainly uh, significant. And in addition to the uh, chelicerate uh, arthropods, which make it out on the land, um, so too do uh, myriapods like uh, centipedes and millipedes. Now, these actually may have been the first animals on land, uh, given you know what seem to be trackways of these uh, animals. And so, if you were to ask which animals are the first ones you know to uh, appear on land, things that look like you know centipedes and millipedes. Um, uh, were quite likely among them. Uh, some of these in the Carboniferous would get to be uh, huge. As I mentioned, there was a uh, centipede millipede uh, relative which could get to be uh, more than 10 feet uh, long. And so, uh, you know, this is a significant uh, group on uh, land. Um, and then by the Devonian period, there were the most primitive uh, wingless insects known. And then later, uh, obviously, uh, insects, primarily winged uh, insects, uh, then become so you know, diverse that there are more species of insects which have been identified than all other animals uh, combined. So insects are an amazingly successful uh, group of arthropods on land. So a couple of, you know, then quick points. Um, as we consider invertebrates and their fossil uh, history, obviously arthropods are important, not only because today there's, you know, so many of them uh, when we consider species diversity and in the individuals, but also a great chance to consider complexity. You know, can complexity evolve in stages or do animals have to kind of just appear in this complex form? Well, we know that arthropods have not existed for the majority of life on Earth, and modern arthropods have not existed for the majority of the history of arthropods. Um, that we can see animals which have some arthropod features, but not all, some spider features, but not all, some features of modern insects, but not um, uh, modern insects, etc. So it certainly seems that complexity can evolve in stages. And as we look at the fossil record, there were arthropods specific to individual periods of time, whether it be trilobites known from different periods in the Paleozoic, the Eurypterid sea scorpions, the early insects, etc. And it was mass extinctions in the Paleozoic which dramatically changed you know, the arthropod diversity on Earth and the more modern groups of arthropods only appeared after the extinctions of the Paleozoic wiped out uh, the earliest members of the arthropods. Uh, there will be more on the terrestrial arthropods in a subsequent video.